Now, uh, the PDF, as you can see, is important for illustrating and working with economic concepts. Now, let's basically present these economic concepts and illustrate them with the use of this PBF. Now, uh, let's consider this, uh, you know, uh, PBF, okay? Now, we have two goods. Uh, we have along the horizontal axis, we have motorcycles, and along the vertical axis, we have houses, of course. It is a concave downward PBF, uh, of course, which is, uh, you know, uh, most fit for uh, the real world, uh, you know, situation. Now, let's, you know, talk about the concepts that can be, you know, uh, used with B the PBF, or can be, of course, uh, worked with the PBF. The first concept is scarcity. As you remember from chapter one, we said scarcity is the condition uh, where the uh, where our wants, you know, or desires are greater than the resources available to satisfy them. So you have here that resources uh, in the economy are finite, you know, uh, and wants are infinite. So the finiteness of resources can be, you know, graphically portrayed by the PPF. As you can see, this PPF, you know, shows the finiteness, uh, uh, you know, in the, uh, of resources in the economy. So as you can see here, this PPF, you know, separates the economy into two regions. As you can see, one region is attainable region, and the other one, which is unattainable. The attainable region is the region that, you know, you can produce uh, in that region. However, the unattainable region is the region that it is beyond our resources, beyond our ability to produce. Therefore, uh, the attainable regions consist of the combinations uh, along the BBF and inside the BBF, namely A, B, C, D, E, and F. All these combinations along the BBF and inside the BBF are attainable. You know, our resources allow us to produce in these, you know, uh, combinations. However, the unattainable region is the one that beyond this PBF, which is, uh, you know, one combination is G. G is beyond, you know, our resources, uh, beyond, you know, our ability to produce there. So therefore, we have two regions. The unattainable region is the region that we are unable to produce there. Uh, one combination in the unattainable region is a G. So we can't produce a G. Now, uh, of course, as we said, this PBF separates, you know, the production possibilities into two regions, as I said. Uh, we have attainable region and we have unattainable region, of course, uh, and the attainable region consists of the combinations along the BBF, such as A, B, C, D, and E, and inside the BBF, such as F, and the unattainable region is the one, as you can see, is outside the BBF, and, you know, which consists of G. Now, great. Another concept that can be illustrated with the BBF is the choice and opportunity cost. The choice, you remember, when resources are scarce, finite, then we have to make choices. You remember, here we have, you know, within the attainable region, we have hundreds of combinations. You know, for instance, here we have five combinations, you know, within the attainable region, we have five along the BBF and one inside the BBF. So, uh, of course, uh, to choose you can't be at all these combinations. You have to be at only one combination. To produce two goods, you have to be at one combination, either at A or B or C or D or E. 
and if you have your resources, uh, uh, if some of your resources are unemployed, then you could be below the BBF, such as 0.5. So to produce two goods, you have to be at only one combination, either at A, B, C, D, or E. Okay, now, to move from A to B, or B to C, or C to D, or D to E, then you have to incur a cost. That cost is called opportunity cost. So, anytime you make a choice, you incur a cost called opportunity cost. You know, for instance, moving from A to B. If you don't want to be at A, and you want to be at B, then you have to move from A to B. Once you move from A to B, then you incur an opportunity cost. And we have already talked about the opportunity cost. Of course, you know, for instance, at A, you are producing 60 uh, houses, and 10 motorcycles. At B, you are producing 55 houses and 20, of course, motorcycles. So, moving from A to B means producing more motorcycles, producing 10 motorcycles, you know, at the expense of what? Of five houses. So, when you move from A to B, you produce more motorcycles, however, at the expense of producing less houses, uh, so you produce, uh, you know, uh, seven houses less because 60, uh, sorry, uh, 60 and five, 55. So you produce, uh, you know, uh, less houses. So, you know, the opportunity cost of 10 motorcycles is what? Is five uh, lost houses. Okay? Now, of course, uh, here we have to talk about, distinguish between, you know, uh, combinations that are efficient and combinations that are inefficient. Combinations that are productive efficient and combinations that are productive inefficient. All combinations, economists talk about, you know, combinations that are productive efficient. What actually do we mean when we say productive efficient? So we say here, all combinations that are along the BBF are productive efficient. In other words, the combinations that give you the maximum output. So the combinations that are along the BBF give you the maximum output with the available resources, with the given resources, and the given state of technology. Okay, you are producing the maximum output. So, A, B, C, D, E are productive efficient because they give us the maximum output with the available resources and, you know, their given level of technology. However, you know, uh, all resources or all combinations that are below the uh, below the BBF are productive inefficient. Why? Because these will give you uh, less than the maximum output. Why productive? Such as you know combination F. F is productive inefficient. Productive inefficient. Why? It gives us you know uh, uh, less than the maximum output. Why actually, you know, the economy or the firm or the individual tend to produce at F rather than at C or D or E along the BBF? Why? Because, you know, uh, of course, uh, there's not, you know, uh, maybe because there is no utilization of the whole of the resources. This is because some of the resources are out of order or unemployed. They are unemployed. That's the why. When some of the resources are not functioning, then, of course, you will produce, you will be producing, uh, you know, less than the maximum, such as at point F. Okay? So, one reason why, you know, we are producing at F is that because there are some resources are unemployed. You know, some resources are unemployed. Now, of course, 
uh, Hina, of course, here, as you can see, uh, you know, unemployed resources take place when the economy exhibits productive inefficiency. It is not producing the maximum output with the available resources and technology. One reason is that some of its resources are unemployed. Now, as you can see over here, you know, uh, of course, uh, productive inefficiency implies that gains are possible. Productive inefficiency, as like at point F, implies that gains are possible in one area without losses in another. So let's say we are at point F, which is an efficient point. Of course, you know, we can move to point C along the BBF. And so at point C, we are producing more, you know, uh, of course, we are producing more uh, houses, but not fewer, you know, motorcycles. So, it's possible to move from a, an efficient point to an efficient point. Of course, also we can move from F to D. When we move from F to D, we can produce more of both goods more houses and more motorcycles. At point D, of course, you produce, for instance, 30 uh, houses and 45, you know, motorcycles. However, at point F, you produce uh, 40 motorcycles and 25 houses. So, when you move from F to D, you produce more of both goods. Or, you can move from F to E. From F to E. Of course, at F, as I said, you produce 40 motorcycles and 25 houses. Now at E, you produce more motorcycles, 55, and the same level of houses. No fewer than houses. Therefore, uh, you know, productive inefficiency implies that gains are possible in one area without losses in another. You, have, you can have gains in both, or at least gains in one, however, no loses in the other. Now, we move to talk about economic growth. What actually do you mean with economic growth? Remember that economic growth will cause a shifting outward of the BBF. This BBF, when you have economic growth, then this BBF will shift outward. Of course, what causes economic growth? Of course, you know, we have two factors that cause economic growth. The first one is that an increase in the level of resources, an increase in the amount of resources, and we know that resources, either we have, you know, land, uh, labor, capital, or entrepreneurships. And land, of course, uh, you know, it is, uh, consists of all the natural resources. You know, discovery of oil well, you know, iron, water, wood, you know, all these are, you know, under the term land, of course. Now, uh, so we have two factors that can cause economic growth, namely an increase in the amount of resources, and the other one is that the, uh, you know, attaining an advanced level of technology. So these two factors, once uh, we, are, we have them, then we will, come, we will have an economic growth. And once the economic growth exists, then it will cause a shifting outward of the, you know, BBF. Now, look over here. Now, here, of course, uh, 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 an increase in the amount of resources or uh, an advance of technology, you know, it causes a shift of the BBF outward, you know, and, and causes an increase in both goods you know, in both goods, in civilian goods and in military goods. You know, as you can see, the maximum amount of civilian goods has, uh, uh, you know, has risen, and the maximum amount of military goods has risen. So, as you can see, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the economic growth, you know, uh, which, is, which comes as a result of an increase in the amount of resources, for instance, perhaps the discovery of an oil well, you know, this will cause, 
here in this in part A has causes you know an increase in both goods. However, sometimes an advanced level of technology will cause uh, you know a shift outward, shift of the PBF outward, but it will cause you know an increase in in only one good in the amount of one good uh, uh, you know and no increase in the other good that's uh, what i'm saying here sometimes as in part b the level of technology the advance of technology of course has uh, caused you know uh, 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 an economic growth and the economic growth has caused a shift of the pbf as you can see uh, you know uh, and then that shift has caused you know uh, a, a rise in the maximum amount of civilian goods from A prime to B prime. However, you know, the maximum amount of, you know, military goods, you know, did not rise, okay? No change in the maximum amount of military goods. So as you can see, sometimes the, uh, the, uh, uh, the economic growth or the advance of the technology can cause you know, or is biased, could be biased to uh, one good uh, uh, instead of the other good. And sometimes the advance of technology causes a shift of the outward, shift of the BBF outward, and causes an increase in the maximum amount of both goods. Okay? As you can see in, in A, uh, where the two goods, the maximum amount of the two goods have increased, and in B, we can uh, see only uh, the civilian goods, the maximum amount of civilian goods has increased, has risen, while the uh, military goods, uh, you know, uh, has uh, uh, not changed. Okay, now we move to uh, another topic, perhaps the final topic in, the, in this chapter, which is specialization and trade can move us beyond our PPF. Great. Now, here, in order to show that the importance of specialization and trade, we're going to give an example of, uh, you know, a simple two-person PBF model, where we have two persons, each is producing two goods, okay? So, the persons in this example are Ahmed and Dalal, okay? Now, and each engages in the production of two goods, namely X and Y. The two goods are X and Y. X is along the X axis, and Y is along the Y axis or vertical axis. Great. Now, here we have the, you know, the combination of, uh, you know, of the two goods that each, you know, can produce in terms of a table and in terms of PBF. So here, you know, this is the combination of the two goods that Ahmed can produce. You know, uh, uh, of course, as you can see, he, when he devotes all his resources to the production of Y, he produces 20 units of Y and zero units of X. You know, also he can divide his resources between X and Y, you know, perhaps, perhaps equally, and so he produces 10x and 10y. If he puts all his resources in the production of x, then he produces the maximum of x, which is 20 units of x, and 0y. Now, in terms of the PPF, uh, you know, we draw this, we draw this, uh, you know, these combinations uh, in an xy, and the PPF, as you can see, is, uh, you know, is a straight line, uh, which shows that we have a, a constant opportunity cost uh, model. Great. Now, as a consumer, you know, here Ahmed produces these. Now, as a consumer, he likes to eat or to consume X and Y. So definitely he should be at combination B, where he, you know, consumes 10 Y and 10 X. Because he can't be at A or B. If he likes A, if he likes X and Y, he should be at combination B. Why? Because at A, he doesn't have X. And at, at, at C, he doesn't have Y. Because he likes X and Y, 
is so he should be a compilation bit. Now we go to you know the LAL uh, uh, data. As you can see, the LAL produces X and Y. If she devotes all her resources in the production uh, of Y, then she produces the maximum of Y, which is 10, and zero X. If she, you know, put parts of her, uh, you know, resources uh, in X and Y, then she produces 5Y and 15X. However, if she devotes all her resources in the production of X, then she produces the maximum of X, which is 30 units of X, and zero one. Now, in terms of the PPF, you know, we put this data on PPF, and we come up with this, you know, uh, a straight line PPF, which shows that we have a constant, you know, opportunity cost model, you know? So we have a straight line, therefore, we have a constant opportunity cost. Now, as a consumer, you know, the LAL would like to eat or consume X and Y, so definitely she should be at combination E, where she consumes 5Y and 15X. Great. So she, the LAL is at combination E and Ahmed at combination B. Now, now of course, both Ahmed and the lab believe that uh, they become better off if they specialize in the production of only one good and trade it for the other good. In other words, the lab should be, should be producing X or Y and trade that good for the other good. The same thing, Ahmed should produce either good, either X or Y, not both and trade the other for the other good. But however, both don't know which good they should specialize in. So an economist would advise, uh, you know, that uh, a person specializes in the production of the good that he or she can produce at a lower cost. Great. So in economics, we have the concept of comparative advantage. So in economics, a person is said to have a comparative advantage if he or she can produce a good at a lower cost than another. Okay, so now we say here, let's compare the opportunity cost. So moving from A to B, moving from A to B, the production of, you know, X increases, at the expense of the production of Y. So the opportunity cost, as you move from A to B, the opportunity cost of 10X is 10Y. 10X, 10Y. So what's the opportunity cost of 1X, of 1X is 1Y. So we can see here, uh, opportunity cost of 10X equal 10Y. Therefore, the opportunity cost of 1X is 1Y. What we do, we divide over 10, 10, again, 1x equal 1y. So the opportunity cost of 1x equal 1y. The same thing moving from B to C. We know that we have constant opportunity cost, but let's verify this. Moving from B to C, of course, uh, the opportunity cost of, you know, what if, when you move from B to C, then the production of x increases. However, the production of y decreases. Now, the opportunity cost of 10 additional x is going to be 10, is equal 10 addition, 10 y. y will be, you know, decreases by 10. So the opportunity cost of 1x is 1 y. So that's what we have. Therefore, for Ahmed, the opportunity cost of 1x equal 1 y, or 1 y, 1 x. The opportunity cost of 1 x is 1 y, or the opportunity cost of 1 y equal 1 x. Great, that's what we have for Ahmed. Let's see the opportunity cost for, uh, you know, Dela. For the LAL moving from D to E, moving from D to E, from D to E. Now moving from, of course, D to E, D to E, what you see, X increases at the expense of Y. X increases from 0 to 15. 
while y decreases from 10 to 5. So the decrease in y is 5 units, however, the increase in x is 15 units. So the opportunity cost of 15x is equal 5y. So what we do, what is the opportunity cost of 1x? All we have to do here, 15x, 5y. So the opportunity cost of 1x is equal 1 third y. Okay, 1x is equal. One third y. What we do? We divide here by 15. Divide by 15. You come up one x equal five over 15 is one third y. Okay. Now, moving from e to f, uh, from e to f. What happens? The uh, the the amount of x increases from 15 to 30. That is the opportunity cost of 15 additional x is going to be at the expense of five y. So what we have here. Opportunity cost of 15x equal 5y, that is, opportunity cost of 1x equal 1 third y. Therefore, before the land, the opportunity cost are these 1x equal 1 third y, or 1y equal 3x. 1y equal 3x. Now, as I said here, uh, the economists advise them to specialize in the uh, production of the good in which, you know, they have a comparative advantage in it. That is, they can produce it at a lower cost than the other. So what you see here, if you look, if you compare the opportunity cost for uh, here, uh, for Ahmed and uh, for the land, you see that Ahmed it produces 1x and uh, the cost of producing 1x is 1y. What about for the lab? The cost of producing one x is one third y. So as you can see here, that the lab can produce x at a lower cost than uh, uh, Ahmed produce. So the lab has a comparative advantage in the production of x. So we can say here, the lab has a comparative advantage in the production of x. The lab forfeits one third one third of y to produce one x. However, Ahmed forfeits one y to produce one x. Therefore, the land produces x at a lower cost than uh, Ahmed does. Therefore, the land has a comparative advantage in x. And as a result of this, the land should specialize in the production of x. What about, you know, y? You know, if you look over here, uh, Ahmed produces Y. When he produces Y, the cost of, of producing Y is 1X. When he produces Y, he forfeits 1X. What about the lab? When she produces Y, she forfeits 3X. That is, the cost of producing 1Y is higher for the lab than for Ahmed. Therefore, Ahmed has a comparative advantage uh, in the production of Y, because he produces Y at a lower cost than the land. So now, what we see here, uh, you know, here, Ahmed has a comparative advantage in the production of Y, and the land has a comparative advantage in the production of X. So, according to the rule we just stated, then Ahmed should specialize in the production of Y, only in Y. That is, Ahmed should be here. Ahmed should specialize in Y here. And the land should specialize in what? The land should specialize in X, which is here. So Ahmed only produces Y, and the land only produces X. Now, of course, that is, now, we, now they specialize. Now, we said that specialization and the trade would move them to a better situation. They will become better off. So now after specializing, each one specializes in the good in which he has a comparative advantage, then now trade. So what we do now, if both decide, so when we said there, both specialize in the production of the good in which they have a comparative advantage. Therefore, Ahmed produces only Y and the Lal produces only X. Suppose both decide to trade 8y for 
12x. Now, why 8, why 4, 12x? Of course, you could say 9y for, you know, 11x. Uh, we do this one in order to show, yeah, we, we put these numbers uh, to show that after the trade, they still have consumption of the two goods higher than the consumption before the specialization and the trade. You could play with these numbers. As long as, uh, you know, the numbers after, uh, uh, you know, uh, trading uh, gives you a consumption higher than the consumption, uh, you know, before uh, specialization and trade. So we said that, let's say they uh, decide to trade 8Y for 12X. That is, uh, you know, because Ahmed specializes in Y. Ahmed, he trade 8Y and he gives the man 8Y and gets a 12X from it. So when he does that, we come about, you know, Ahmed, you know, Ahmed gives uh, 8Y and gets 12X. So after the trade, we end up with what? You know, Ahmed will have this. Ahmed, after the trade, we get Ahmed. We get here X, we get Y. 12, and we get 12. And here the land, we get X, we get Y. Of course, she get, it, uh, she get 8Y, that's 8Y. And then when she give it 12X, uh, she come up with uh, how much? 18X. Now, these after the trade, these are the, uh, uh, you know, the consumption of the goods after the trade. As you can see, if you compare these, you know, comparing, uh, you know, the, their consumption after the trade and specialization with their consumption before it, specialization and trade, you will see that, uh, you know, this is, this here, you know, these are their consumption, uh, you know, before the trade, before specialization and trade. Ahmed used to consume 10, produce 10, consume 10, uh, X and 10 Y. Now, after specialization and trade, Ahmed is what? It's consuming 12 X and 12 Y. So it's much higher than this. Now, what about, you know, the land? The land before specialization and trade used to be here. Here, over here, at E, 5 and 15, you know, 5 and 15. Now, comparing 5 and 15 with this, now X18 and Y8. Now, of course, greater than, you know, this. So, so their consumption after specialization and trade is higher than their consumption before specialization and trade. So, uh, as you can see, this is after the trade. Now, consumption for Ahmed and Dalal with and without specialization and trade. Look over here. Here, you know, this is here. Uh, I draw here, you know, the, uh, the BBF before and after. This is here in BBF before specialization and trade. This is the one over here. Okay? Now, now drawing this one here for Ahmed, after specialization trade, you will get here at point P prime. Point P prime definitely is higher than B, is up beyond B. So which implies this is here, consumption of the two goods with specialization and trade. However, at B, consumption of the two goods without specialization and trade at B. At B prime with specialization and trade, and at B without specialization and trade. Now look up for at Dalal. Dalal, this is at E is what? Consumption of the two goods without specialization and trade. This is the one over here. Now look after specialization and trade, you can see that it is at E prime. At E prime is higher than E, it's beyond E, which therefore consumption of the two goods 
with specialization and trade is higher. So the conclusion is that when a country or a firm or an individual, when he specializes and the trade, of course, he will become better off, you know, than uh, without specialization and trade. So specialization and trade will move you, will move you to what? Beyond our BDF, you will become better off with the specialization and trade.